I'm Faris Jiraimi. Let me tell you my story. It all begins with this, a book which I co-edited and was published right here. And printed right here. I'm a writer, researcher and bibliophile. Most of all, I'm a historian trying to bridge the past and the present. My day job involves me uncovering lesser-known facts about our history and culture for those of us today. A big part of my work is re-looking Singapore's history outside the colonial lens. The vicinity of Bras Basa and Bugis is an area I have a lot of interest in because of its rich history as Singapore's book quarter. I'm going to look at different skills and objects, anonymous artists and makers. I want to uncover a lesser known side of Bras Basa and Bugis, one that is rooted in local stories and perspectives. Did you know that this, this, and also, but especially, and I say this with nothing but affection, this were all made in Singapore. What else was made here? What else has helped make Singapore the Singapore it is today? I'm focused on one of my favourite spots in all the island, the Bras Basa and Bugis Precinct. Bras Basa is actually already a British misspelling of Bras Basa, which means wet rice in Malay. In the early days, wet rice was laid to dry here, on the banks of a freshwater stream, or what is now the Stamford Canal. Today, the boundaries of Bras Basa and Bugis Precinct look like this. And I'm using this map as a guide to focus my search. Part of my research interest is in looking at Singapore's histories beyond the colonial lens. I'd like to delve into the lesser-known aspects of an important part of Singapore town, Bras Basa. But Bras Basa beyond the European town as it was designated in the British town plan. And really to think about Bras Basa as shaped by many different groups of people that give us a different idea of the area. To do so, I have to really unpack what made in Singapore means, what made in Bras Basah in Bugis means. I'm starting with what I know best, my obsession, books, and by extension, the world of publishing, to see if there may be other leads that might turn up. Soon Yao Yu runs typesetting SG a local studio on the periphery of the Bras Basa and Bugis precinct. His mission, to preserve and promote the traditional letterpress trade. What are some of the oldest things you have in your, in your collection? Yeah, let me show you. Yeah. Oh, I really like this one. Incredible, look at yeah. that. Right here, I have one of the oldest catalog on printing equipment that I have in the studio, the mm -hmm. Chinese typeface. This is from the 1939. There we go. So it's yes. before the war. Actually. Yes, before the war. Right. He's a self-taught printer who spent seven years building his independent studio, one typeface at a time. What we'll be doing now is yeah. actually to do a typeset of your name. Mm -hmm. So start from your first letter, F. F. If you're good in mahjong, this will be easy for you. Okay. All about lifting up. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And onto the table. Oh my. And then I'll do the inking. Yeah. So we'll lift up the chase to push it into this area. Okay. Well, it's a lot sharper than I expected, actually. Yes, just okay. nice. Okay. Activities like this started in 1822 uh, with the missionaries from London Mission Society. Claudius Henry Thompson actually bought with him a small printing press and some printing equipment to do some printings. But the official mission press was set up in 1823 with the approval from Raffles. Mm -hmm. And that actually began the 30-odd years of uh, mission press in Singapore. 
Henry Thompson and Samuel Milton ran the mission press out of three large buildings at the junction of Northbridge Road and Brasbassa Road. They housed the printing press, its workmen and stores. So it was actually a mission press meant to print the government content. Subsequently, later on, this was actually used to print applications content as well. So for about 30 years, you had this one printing operation that basically dominated the industry. But over those three decades, the function of the press expanded in a huge way. During this period of time, we have the earliest newspaper, the Singapore Chronicle. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, from 1824 right. until and the 1830s. It was a commercial newspaper which included official government notices as well as details of trade and shipping. What began as the London Mission Press, with the aim to spread Christianity in the region, rapidly burgeoned into a whole industry of printers creating work in multiple languages. All right, yeah, there we go. We've got Boulder. Yes, a lot Boulder. What my conversation with YY has opened up is an entire hidden world behind the printed word that often gets forgotten in histories of writing and literature in Singapore. What I find ironic is that according to Yao Yu's best knowledge, there are no Jawi types that survive from this earlier period. Despite the fact that Singapore was once the centre of printed Malay publications in Jawi, Reverend Claudius Thompson is often credited for producing some of the earliest Malay language publications in Singapore and the Malay Peninsula. But he wasn't able to have done that without the help of one important local, his learned Malay teacher, Munshi Abdullah, a scholar from Malacca born in 1796. The two men had a testy relationship because they had different ideas about what was correct Malay, but they also succeeded in collaborating to produce numerous Malay publications together. I'm curious to know what Munshi Abdullah looked like. All we have is a quote by J.T. Thompson, a contemporary of Abdullah, describing him. To bring these words to life, I'm getting help from illustrator Matthew Wong. Is he like a commission? Uh, yeah, commission work. I have a blank piece of paper. <laughs> okay. Nice. First, let's start with his general appearance. Tamilan of southern Hindustan with an oval face. He also had a high nose and one squinting eye. 19th century, and the skull cap that's, that goes up pretty high is, a, is an Ottoman fashion yeah, that uh, was adopted later as well. He dressed like a middle-class urban man, an elite back in the day, really. Just adding the last touches. So let's write down some things that are very popularly associated with Munshi Abdullah. He was Raffles' secretary. He was a tutor to missionaries in Singapore. He was also the first Malay man to write an autobiography. Mm -hmm. And he's also been credited by most scholars for being the father of modern Malay literature. For me, this regal image doesn't sit too well, because lots of other accounts paint quite a different picture of him. His own son talks about him as a lover of life, who threw parties with his friends. He was, you know, very interested in constructing a very specific image of himself, much the same way bloggers today do. So <laughs> he's very much like a blogger of the past. Despite the inaccuracies, Munshi's accounts have contributed so much to our history. His work with the Mission Press in Northbridge Road fueled the production of numerous other Malay publications resulting in a massive boom in the publishing industry beyond. It basically means it was printed, printed. in Kampung Glam, Singapore. Yeah. Many of these pages have survived to this day. What did they contain? Who wrote and printed them? And what was their significance for Singapore?
As a kid, I did nothing but read. So I was thrilled to discover Bras Basa Complex as a teenager, a dedicated home of books, famous and loved by Singaporeans. It was in university that I dived into history and how the colonial lens has shaped so much of what we know of our past. So I co-wrote and edited a book that focused on local stories about our origins. Now I'm on a different quest. I've been on a journey to find out what was made out of the Bras Basa and Bugis area in the past. As a writer, it's one of my most loved areas in Singapore because of its ties to books and the publishing world. So far, I found that the earliest printed works came out of the Mission Press in Northbridge Road, Singapore's first printing facility. Its links to a local Malay scribe, Munshi Abdullah, has led me through history and right here to the National Library. For centuries, Malay was the lingua franca of the region, used as a language of trade, diplomacy and culture. But it's only because of those who wrote its literature and had a hand in publishing it that those stories have survived for so long. Today, I'm here to look at some of the oldest printed pages in Singapore. Actually, it's too far. It's too far. It's Arabic. Tofa Abdul Wahid is a senior librarian with the National Library, Singapore. So overlooked, books are super overlooked. Absolutely. Malay literature. Yes. I mean, it was, it was used in Malay. Her research interests lie in early Singapore Malay publications and food history. Something that started in her final year in university when she was inspired by a sudden and immense craving for laksa to write an entire thesis about belacan. The Mission Press was the first printing press in Singapore. They produced this one in 1829. Oh, okay. on the it was actually authored and translated by the missionary Claudius Henry Thompson. He received tutelage from Munshi Abdullah, yep. who was a language teacher. He was also a translator, an editor, a copyist, mm -hmm. and he also operated the printing press. So this one is titled Hambala Yang Segala Sha'ir Pantun Seloka. Mm. It's a collection of poems that was printed by Haji Muhammad Said right. bin Haji Arshad. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this was printed in 1900. And there was also another printer, Haji Muhammad Siraj mm -hmm. bin Haji Saleh. This was printed in 1888. So this is called Hikayat Bhaktia, mm. which consists of 10 popular stories that were from manuscripts and other printed books. Right. So it's fiction, these works. Very different from the kind of things that... Christian will, literature. Christian literature and, yeah. and, and informative yes. sort of uh, material. Do you want me to read it out in Jawi as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Terchap, Terchap Tempat Terchap. Chap Muhammad Siraj. Kampung Glam Singapura. Singapura. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So it, it basically means it was printed, printed. in Kampung Glam Singapore. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And what did the publishing scene mean for Singapore at the time? I think because of Abdullah's collaborations with the missionaries mm -hmm. and being the pioneers of this printing and publishing industry, it paved the way for subsequent Malay printers ah. to, you know, develop their own businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that Singapore became a printing centre and intellectual centre in the Malay world. Right, fascinating. Yeah. Very soon after this foreign technology of printing arrived in Singapore, it would be enthusiastically adopted by Malays themselves to expand the reach of their literature and to explore new frontiers of ideas. This catalyzed Singapore's role as a publishing hub in the global book trade. The Malay printing industry in Singapore continued to flourish. Javanese immigrants set up printing and publishing houses in Kampung Glam near Sultan Mosque. It became a bustling commercial centre where the local Muslim community would gather. One of the leading printers was Haji Muhammad Saib. The bookshop he ran with his four sons carried Malay books printed in Mecca, Turkey, Russia, Egypt and India. By 1917, the business was running out of 124 Arab Street. I think this was quite likely the very beginning of how the entire area, including Kampung Glam, Bras Basa and Bugis, became our book quarter. Proximity to the city centre made it a great location for schools to set up. 
This boom in schools and the precinct's links to publishing began attracting related businesses like stationery, printing, and yes, you guessed it, bookstores. One of the biggest English bookstores was Methodist Publishing House, or MPH, on Stamford Road. The popular bookstore that we know today was initially called World Book Company. Set up in 1934, it was located on Northbridge Road and quickly became a household name for students and parents in Singapore and the region. Towards the end of the 1970s, most of the book traders along Bras Basa Road and Northbridge Road had been relocated to a new building called Bras Basa Complex, where some of them still stand today. Completed in 1980, Bras Basa Complex promised to be Singapore's major book centre, where occupants could live and work in the same compound. The flats were part of an early public housing plan in the downtown area, developed by the Housing and Development Board in the 70s and 80s. Interestingly, its occupants were actually legally obligated to sell books upon moving in. How strange. And they delivered on that promise, maintaining its colloquial moniker as Singapore's city of books to this day. From the original Bras Basaru, only one is only the only one. Abdul Nasir's family has run Bashir Graphic Books for more than three decades since it opened in the 1990s. So many customers, so they, they slate always breaking down, is it? But nowadays, my slate, no problem. Yeah, 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 no problem. Casual, <laughs> casual. Yeah, is this okay? It's not really an elbow rest. Okay. Yeah. Take two. My father used to do a a hawker bookseller. Hawker bookseller, I mean, just he carry a suitcase, he's going around downtown. I see. So from there, the customer asked me, hey, Mashi, you need to have a bookshop. Ah. So then we found, since a Brass Bass is a, a book place, I so see. we found a space, we moved here. And this was about how many years ago? It's almost 30 plus, 30 over a year. Before there were bookshops, there were mobile book salesmen who would lug their wares around in huge suitcases, going from door to door to showcase books to potential clients. But the mobile book hawking model was backbreaking, and book hawkers saw the worth in setting up brick and mortar stores as demand for books rose in the precinct. So how do you feel the Brass Basa complex has changed over the past three decades? Olden days, there's a lot of bookshops around by. It's a, a lot of students. Uh, it's really it's everybody's uh, books mecca to yeah. here to purchase uh, books, you know. It's really, it's really bustling this place, you know. Too much digitalization, one by one, they're gone, is right? The heyday of Brass Basa Complex has passed, but what do you see to be the role of the physical bookshop in this day and age? I think the society need to preserve a bookshop, you know, okay. You know, the bookshop is a mass for the community, yes. mass for the society, you know. Yes. Even I can have a lot of customers, they're looking at the digital, is a boring, is it? So they want to yeah, the touch and feel, they, they, they need to feel that kind of things. Mm. The bookshop also is making a meeting point for the, my customers, you know, that come together. I agree, I do also think that the bookshop is a community space, yeah, it's more than just commercial. While well, Bashir Graphic Books is one entity in a greater ecosystem in Bras Basa, it has helped to contribute to its culture of reading, writing and thinking, along with the printers and schools. It's also keeping an experience you won't ever get in the digital world very much alive. Want to know more about the obscure recommendations? Ask the bookseller. So, Mr. Abdulnasir, what's your favourite book in the shop? Mr. <laughs> Abdulnasir. This author is a designer. I think he's a designer for Muji. Mm, so yeah. you're talking about a lot of minimalist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's a really lovely book as well. Basa isn't just known for books and stationery, but also... Photo studios? 
Was it possible that some of these photographers or these photo studios were the ones taking pictures featured in many of the postcards? Yes, totally yeah. possible. Could some of the images that shaped impressions of Singapore as an exotic Southeast Asian vice city have originated in the Bras Basa Bugis precinct? So here I am, in the Bugis and Bras Basa area. Growing up, I'd always marvelled at the eclectic clash of commercial Singapore with the rich and diverse artistic heritage of the area. I'm on a mission to find things that were created here. So far, I've uncovered how the precinct earned its place as Singapore's city of books. Books were quite literally made there. Another familiar sight for a local historian in training are postcards dating back to the late 1800s. They are often colloquially referred to as Japanese postcards because of how they feature iconic Singaporean images on one side, but heartfelt notes written to and received by Japanese immigrants of the past on the other. I've been looking at postcards, oh. and photo studios were, were a big part of that. Um, yes. What are some that you can see over here in this map? This is Kevin Ko. He's a translator and he's going to help me decipher this map. This one that caught my eye is uh, Nakajima Shashinka, Nakajima Photo Studio. Mm. It used to be situated in Raffles Hotel. Yes, you've got me. I can't help but wonder if these postcards could have been made in Japanese photo studios in Middle Road, often referred to as Little Japan because it was where Singapore's early Japanese community lived from the late 1800s right up until the Second World War. That's my guess anyway. We're referencing a map in a book written by the Japanese Association in Singapore. It was carefully researched and hand-drawn for one of their publications circa 1998 about the community's long history here. Over here, there's a Tokunaga Shashinkan, Tokunaga oh, Photo right. Studio. And that's at the junction between Bras Basa yes. Road and Bankulan Street. Yes. Ah. In total, Kevin has identified at least six studios in Middle Road in 1938. But we've also found that Little Japan was home to a whole slew of trades. General stores, carpenters, pharmacies. We're talking about barbers, so mm. I'll just put a few... Um, sure, yeah, barbers. Pick my eye. So there's a barber shop here right next to this photo studio. Uh -huh. Actually, there's a dentist um, as well, many dentists. Right. So again, back, back to old so this is one next to it, Ikeda. Ah. Here as well, Hashimoto. So all near photo studios. And Kevin's theory as to why there are so many barbers and dentists concentrated here? Could be that people went to you know, get cleaned up, get everything done professionally before taking a photo. Right. I mean, going to look good camera, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Kevin has helped me ascertain that there were indeed, amongst a whole gamut of other trades, quite a few photo studios in Middle Road, and that my theory could be sound. But were they the ones who made these iconic postcards? I'm back at the National Library, where I'm meeting experts Professor Naoko Shimazu from Yale and U.S. College and Mr. Lim Xiaobin. Mr. Lim sacrificed countless lunch hours poring over dusty boxes in antique bookstores while working in Japan, collecting an immense number of Japanese artefacts associated with Singapore. He's the man behind the unique Lim Shao Bin collection. A donated treasure trove of about 3,000 rare and unique objects in the National Library. Today, he's donating one more priceless piece, a never-before-seen newspaper from 1920. It's the Nanyo Nichinichi Shinbun and was targeted at the Japanese community in Singapore and Malaya. This is Kadori Senko. Mosquito coil, yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Looks like very popular here yeah. in Singapore. So there were lots of things made in Singapore by the Japanese at the time, mm. as this shows. Mr. Lim's vast donation, comprising of maps, travel guides, and today, a full newspaper, harbors invaluable insights about the early Japanese community in Singapore. There is one group of items in particular that I'm interested in. I asked whether they were very expensive. To no, no, not expensive. One what lunch. Expensive. You can see that I sacrifice how many... Many lunches, lunches <laughs> in here. Right, right. Yeah. 
Interestingly, or not, my research meeting with them about photo studios in Little Japan starts with quite an unexpected revelation. Some of the people who grew up in Singapore, Japanese people grew up in Singapore and lived and knew the area, mentioned that it was not called Little Japan at the time. Okay. It was, they just referred it to as Middle Road, Midoru Road. Okay. Mm. Inaccurate labels aside, are my hunches about Japanese photo studios producing these iconic postcards off the mark? Was it possible that some of these photographers or these photo studios were the ones taking pictures featured in many of the postcards that appear from this time? Yes, totally possible. And that's exactly what actually happened. Uh -huh. Some of the postcards that Mr. Lim has donated actually feature pictures taken by Togo photographers, Togo Shashinkan, uh -huh. which was on 158 Middle Road. There were other photo studios in Singapore, which were obviously not Japanese run, but photo studios even within the Japanese community, out of about 2,700 people, only 44 were involved. Oh. So it's not actually as many as you think. It's just quite prominent mm. because of, I think, the identification that Singapore has with Japanese um, sort of prostitutes. From the 1800s, there was an Orientalist obsession that swirled around the geisha in Western imagination. There was even a subsidiary concept called Japonisme, a French term coined in the late 19th century to describe the craze for Japanese art, design and culture in the West. Here, maybe this is the first place that, let's say, European travellers who come to the East, uh, they encounter Japanese prostitutes. As if being a conduit for everything between exotic images and heartfelt notes to loved ones wasn't enough, these unassuming postcards also served a political purpose. How else did these postcards um, contain information? The Crown Prince Hirohito visited Singapore in okay. 1921. So the Singapore Japanese community decided to make a presentation to tell Crown Prince this is Singapore. On page one, images of Singapore, the quintessential modern tropical city. What else screams exotic tropical paradise more than rubber plantations? And of course, one mustn't forget the crocodile. This is a very intelligent way to use postcards mm. as our PowerPoint. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. right. They quickly became a perfect embodiment of early material culture, as something portable and cheap you could own. It had a very strong popular appeal. Yeah, it was yeah. available to everybody. Westerners could buy these things. Yeah. And Singapore, in that sense, is very much part of the global picture. Right. Mm. These postcards, in particular, are so important because they travelled to distant lands and built global impressions of Singapore as a romantic tropical destination worthy of a visit. They provided their recipients with an inkling of life in Singapore, as well as ideas of places to visit, sights to see, and foods to savour. But wait, doesn't that sound kind of familiar? Don't you think postcards are pretty much the historical equivalent of our social media posts or texts? Look at this. An anonymous sender is writing to Mrs. T. Shinkai to tell her about his experience eating fresh watermelon, pineapple, banana and pomelos, and that he bought a watch for 50 yen, which is way more than what he would have had to pay in Japan. Or our modern equivalent of fresh exotic fruits, hashtag for the win, hashtag food of the day, and had to buy a watch for 50 yen, super X, hashtag zo oh my god. I see our grams as the modern little picture squares of everyday life we share with our friends or the world of where to visit, what to do. Kind of like, well, postcards. In the same way we use social media today, many of the card messages were brief because they were written and sent quickly. Just as we caption our Insta stories or WhatsApp pictures to share snippets of our lives. Japanese photo studios and the physical postcards they produced are long gone. But the spirit of what they created to do lives on in the digital world of our social media posts. 
postcards and promotional travel paraphernalia, consumer culture and advertising. All this got me thinking about another product, or service, so to speak, that had ties to the Bras Basa and Bukis area. I'm looking at some old newspapers today, namely Nanyang Siang Pao, one of the most widely circulated Chinese broadsheets in Singapore at the time. It was printed out of 975 Northbridge Road by Fu Wu Man. And I want to draw your attention to some old Chinese illustrations that appeared here. During the 1920s, powered by large-scale printing technology, print advertising production flourished with the demand for news and information. Advertising art began playing a bigger role in the economy after several talented graphic artists moved from China to Singapore from the 1920s onwards. Newspapers and magazines were a significant platform for small businesses looking to reach consumers. By 1932, the combined circulation of the five biggest Chinese papers in Singapore was almost 50,000 for a community of over 400,000 people. Companies would commission illustrators to draw adverts for them. And these were people who were trained in fine arts. They began as formal academic painters before coming to Singapore and engaging in more commercial work. These Chinese graphic artists, whom I like to call the Chinese madmen, my own reference to the madmen or advertising agency men of New York City's Madison Avenue in the 1950s, combined their mastery of the Chinese language and painting to give advertisers an edge. Many of their studios weren't based within the Bras Basa and Bugis precinct, but the papers that commissioned them were. And later on, their work took on more politically charged overtones. The very same artists channeled their genius into another cause, anti-Japanese propaganda comics. Ironically, at selling at effective advertising in this case led to some of them being executed. This catalyzed comic artists' foray into broader political themes and issues. Come, sir, let me show you some interesting things about this picture. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Dan Wong is a comic artist, illustrator, and graphic designer in Singapore. So this actually is me. So the story is that I can't sleep without my booster. While his professional work includes commissions for the National Arts Council, the Wildlife Reserve, and even the National Library Board, some might call his personal work a little more provocative. This one got really famous, yes. I remember. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Dan, you're working with very sensitive subject matter. Where, where does the boundary lie for you in your work? I personally feel that drawing about political issues in this day and age is a very different thing from, say, 30 years ago. Everybody in the world is just a little bit more expressive. Politics in art is inescapable and unavoidable, yeah. right? Because policies affect our lives and we respond in kind, right? right. So as a cartoonist, even if I draw about myself getting squished in an MRT that is too crowded, that frustration is derived from particular policies. We can't Absolutely. run away from yeah. politics in cartoons. Yeah. There exists a particular role in history that has never changed, and that is the jester in the court. Yep. So, and you um, see yourself as the jester in the I court. Am the in the court. <laughs> I am the jester in the court, right? And the jester has a particular device, mm. satire uh, and humour, yeah. that he uses to navigate these boundaries. Nah. The jester still has to walk the line. I, right. <laughs> right? Why the medium of the cartoon? As a layperson, I personally consume a ton of cartoons. I personally am able to better absorb information if it is presented in a simpler format. Uh, one that's more easily accessible and one that entertains. Right. Illustrations played many roles historically, whether that's at the strictly commercial or something more politically oriented. While illustrations often seem uh, not quite on the same level as high art or it's not seen as something serious, but it's always often had important things to say and played key roles in commenting on critical issues of the day. Through Dan's work, the tradition of using illustration to influence continues, just as the Chinese madmen of advertising did in the past. 
It's one of those things born out of the vicinity of Bras Basa and Bugis that has evolved but remained, and will continue to remain, relevant in shaping how people see the world. I realize I've been on a journey led by my personal interest in publishing, so I'm hitting the streets to see what else I could be missing. The answer could have been right under my nose this entire time. This is a familiar sight. The tali pinggang haji was something I encountered many times growing up. My grandfather had it, and it was a typical part of the Hajj pilgrim's outfit. I want to know more about the story behind its creation. Okay, Inji, right. maybe we can take a look at one of the belts. Money belt. Mm. This is money. Put money, yeah. key, something. Very practical. Yeah. yeah, you've got two. There's a yeah. zipper yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, wow. Right, right, of course. Haji Said and his family have helped run this business since his father, VSS Varusai, established it in 1924. How can I not? Bapa, 1924, hmm. dia buka kerja sini. Sampai sekarang kita jalan lagi. Belakang 1930 something dia be buat telipingan haji, making belt in factory. Today yeah. is it still very popular the Hajj belt? Still, still popular. We export to Arab country, Dubai, Saudi, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei. VSS Varusai is the sole Singaporean maker and distributor of the Tali Pinggang Haji today. People are generally pretty familiar with the product, but what I'm interested in are the hidden, obscure stories. I know there's another origin story of the belt, and that has to do with a prominent Malay pioneer, Haji Yusuf, who contributed greatly to the development of Kampung Glam through his businesses and investments. So what is the connection between VSS and Haji Yusuf Talipinga? He mixed with the, my father. Uh -huh. He's friendly, he took some quantity and he's also selling. The story of the famous green belt isn't new to me per se. It's been so close to me that I've totally overlooked its significance to my mission. But what is new to me is that the origins of the belt are more shared than I'd originally known. We import this material all from England, uh -huh. from Czechoslovakia, wow. from Thailand, uh -huh. Thailand from leather. This is from Italy. Uh -huh. All put together in Singapore, assembled. Very international. <laughs> Like how the belts are a sum of many parts imported from all over the world, the origins of the belt are equally diverse. And I want to dig even deeper to understand why these belts were created in the first place. Haji Yusuf is known for entertaining people right. for lunch every Friday. This is Kir Johari, a close friend and someone who'd know the origins of Haji Yusuf's belt venture inside out. He's a respected heritage consultant and collector of Malay artefacts. Oh, also, he's Haji Yusuf's great-grandson. What were some of your personal experiences for as someone being so close to the story? Well, as a kid, you know, playing under the statues of Gedong Kuning, you encounter the remnants of, you know, the, uh, the, the making of the belt. Kier spent his childhood visiting what we often colloquially refer to as the Yellow Mansion, or Gedong Kuning. One of the multiple properties Haji Yusuf owned as part of his myriad holdings. Many think Haji Yusuf be ballin just because of the sale of the tali pinggang belts and sungkoks. But he actually made his fortune from the rental of multiple properties and played several prominent roles in the Malay community. We're trying to understand the person who wears different hat on different occasions. Mm. He would wear this, right, when he attends his meeting and so on. Absolutely. This is something that he got from Java. Haji Yusuf's Tali Pinggang venture begins with him attending the Hajj, a trip expected of any Muslim at least once in their lifetime. Among the paraphernalia that's really important would be the ihram, two pieces of cloth 
One to cover your torso, and the other one is to wrap around you below your waist. Mm. So how do you hold that cloth below your waist? You need a belt. It'll be on, on your foot, you know, doing the, performing your rides you know, for hours and hours. Haji Yusuf was there when he performed his Hajj in 1880. Oh. He felt that there was a need to include a money pouch, to have a zipper perhaps, perhaps a hoop for your keys. That multi-purpose belt. So Haji Yusuf not only became the purveyor, but also he popularised it. Look at this pool, this green pool. So this is his, his choice of colour. This was made in Germany. Mostly Japanese. Japanese. From the late 19th century up to the 1970s, Singapore was the place to do all your hard shopping. Millions of pilgrims would have stopped over here on their way to Mecca. So here, tell us a bit more about Singapore's importance to the Hajj. Well, the Hajj has never been only about religious ritual. There is also the educational component, the commercial component. And imagine going to, the, to Mecca and encountering this United Nation of people. It's so empowering, this exchange of ideas, exchange of worldview. You could come back from the Hajj and it becomes a more thinking person, so to speak. No, the British has always been very comfortable, you know, with, with the Hajj. You know, the British had a long history of relationship with the Ottomans. Yes. So it's no wonder that Singapore became the embarkation point ah. to the Hajj for people in the region and beyond. I've been on a journey to understand what was made, printed, or even created out of the Brass Basa and Bugis precinct. And I wanted to create something of my own, something that would symbolise my quest to uncover a more local history of making in the area. So, YY, I've been thinking of having a physical keepsake to just document and remember all the things that I've kind of learnt and picked up over the past few days. Um, and I was thinking of perhaps some text that I was wondering you, if you could uh, print on, on, a post, on, a, on a little postcard. Um, and I had in mind this quote. You can start with having the original Malay name for the place, which is Bras Basa, wet rice. To see Bras Basa in Bugis through a more local lens, I found a non-British description of the Bugis and Bras Basa precinct and added my own spin to it. Start picking out the B. Okay. Capital B. B. Yep. Another S. There we go. And then, and then, then cap R. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yes. Uh, small E, small E. Here. I keep forgetting. A. We'll put it into the printing press. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do the inking. Yeah. Go up, down. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's actually very crisp. Thanks, YY. I'm not going to show it to you yet, though. You'll get to see it at the end of the show. I found stories that give the history of Bras Basa in Bugis more dimension than the predominantly British history we've known, and with a whole bunch of other characters to boot. This is it. It's a quote from Munshi Abdullah's Hikayat, which he wrote in 1843, describing Bras Basa as it was on the eve of British colonisation. After they came upon the Bras Basa River, they stopped to have a look at the place. In the past, it was a sandbank, that is, a place where sand gathered in heaps. On it were little trees. And here's a quote that I added as a caption. Before the offices and malls, Bras Basa was already a living landscape, where the labour of many forgotten individuals shaped its transformation into a centre for books and learning. May the memory of these hidden worlds and lives endure beyond its story as part of Singapore's European town. This is the culmination of the labour of this whole process. Munshi Abdullah. He's very much like a blogger of the past. And the combination of everything I've discovered about the Malay community's role in our printing history. Singapore became a printing centre and intellectual centre in the Malay world of the Japanese immigrant community's part in how Singapore was perceived through postcards and travel material. This is a very intelligent way to use postcards mm. as our PowerPoint. 
of Chinese illustrators and how they contributed to the commercial industries of the past. We export to Dubai, Saudi, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei. And finally, to local designers' contribution to the Hajj. Singapore became the embarkation point ah. to the Hajj for people in the region and beyond. What I found most interesting on my journey to understand what's made in Singapore is that it really reflects what makes Singapore. The makers of Bugis and Bras Basa are really a microcosm of this city, a diverse mix of trades that reflects its cosmopolitan and multinational past.